Let me tell you one of the statements that attracted me to Islam. This is a logical, simple, and at the same time profound statement. It is a very heavy statement when you give the answer to what is permitted, what is forbidden, what is allowed, what is not allowed. And when you've studied the Old Testament in Leviticus, in Exodus, and especially in Deuteronomy, you're finding so many commandments. And I've heard some say 700, some say 800 heavy commandments, many of them with capital punishment. Scary stuff coming with this monotheistic religion. Then we come to Islam. What does Islam say about all of this? Well, we could look in the Quran and we find that you can't do this, you can do that, you should do this, that you have to do, and so. But what exactly can I tell a brand new person? Somebody that just woke up to Islam, or somebody that just entered Islam, or somebody that doesn't want to enter Islam, but they would at least like to know, what do you guys accept as what you can do and not do? Listen to two statements. In the worldly matters, everything goes, except for what you find a clear evidence in Islam that's forbidden. Worldly matters, do it, unless Islam clearly forbids it. Can I have friends? All the friends you want. Is there any limit? Ah, ah. When you say girlfriend, what did you mean? Because you can say, well, she's a girl and she's a friend. All right. That's okay. But if you have it as two separate words, this is one thing, but when it's all together or a hyphenated word, ah, 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 because it's totally forbidden to have this opposite sex relationship unless you have marriage. So it's a condition. Okay? All right. What about intake? Can I eat anything I want? Absolutely. Enjoy anything you want, except don't eat. This one, this one, this one. Or something been offered to these gods, etc. Okay. Okay, what about drink? Again, have a good time. Anything goes, but not that one. But anything else, but not this. Because whatever intoxicates in large amounts is still forbidden in small amounts. Islam taught us that. So you see how it works. Microwave oven. Why not? How else am I going to heat up my cappuccino? Computer, please give me a break. I live on the computer. TV, uh, duh, hello. <laughs> no problem. All the bid'ah that you want in the dunya, except what Islam forbids. Now, worship. Who has the right to tell us what worship is? The God or something that he created? And that's common sense. The most logic that you could ever come up, if you believe there's a God, he and he alone is the one to dictate what religion he'll accept and what he won't accept. Will God accept the Catholic religion? Will he accept the Shiite religion? Will he accept the Sufi religion? Will he accept the Protestant, will he accept the Hindu, will he accept the Buddhist, will he accept all of these? In fact, anything you name, he's not going to accept it. He's only going to accept what we said in the beginning. The one who doesn't make up a religion, who is just between them and him, sincere in their surrender, their obedience, and their submission in peace to him. That's what he will accept. That's how we understand that some Christians are definitely going to go to paradise. That's how we understand that some Jews and some Hindus and people who we thought as humans, oh, they will never know because we didn't know what's inside of those people. We didn't know at the time when they originated this, we'll talk about Moses at his time, people who followed Moses, even the Quran tells you they're going to go to paradise. People that followed Abraham or Adam, and people who followed the first 
Because we believe that all the religions came from people like prophets that told them later people changed the stuff. But whoever followed their prophets, whoever believed and did their righteousness, they'll never lose a single thing with the law. Because it's not about a man-made religion. It's about what's inside of a person submitting to him. Make sense or no? And by the way, I did leave one group out. I need to mention some Muslims will also get to go to paradise. Oh, that was a sneaky one, wasn't it? Some Muslims will even get to go to paradise. When I've sat with a number of the bishops and the priests, the rabbis, the reformed Jews, the orthodox Jews, with the Buddhists, the priests from them, the pundits from the Hindus, and we sat and I opened up and showed them what Islam really teaches. I didn't find any of them who had any problem, except they would say, I wish we had that and what we have. I wish we would emphasize this. Where is this? We want to find out where that's coming from. So Islam is not tolerant that you make up something in religion. That's why some Muslims cannot go to paradise, because they didn't really do Islam. They tried to use the religion as their own personal tool, and whoever does that is already lost. So it doesn't matter if you're a Catholic and you use your religion as your personal tool or a Muslim and use it as a personal tool. As soon as you do it, you're out. The names of these religions are actually the problem. That's not the core of the problem, but it's an evidence on the surface. Kind of like when you have an eruption on the skin indicates that there is some disease somewhere in the body. It's clear. When you have to name your way of Islam, you've got a problem. As soon as you say our group and our name, that's us, and we're the only right ones, you're the one with the problem. 